This episode of Thinking Through Autonomy is in partnership with the Eno Center for Transportation. Eno is an independent nonprofit think tank focused on transportation. As an organization, Eno shapes public debate on critical multimodal transportation issues and builds an innovative network of transportation professionals. Eno's Aviation Working Group is a standing advisory group on all matters related to aviation policy. In their latest report, Bridging the Gap, Sustaining UAS progress while pursuing a permanent regulatory framework will inform today's discussion. Welcome to Thinking Through Autonomy, a podcast to help you understand the promise and impact of autonomous land and air vehicles in our world. I'm Ken Dunlap, managing partner of Catalyst Go, taking you on this journey. Hear and read more at thinkingthroughautonomy.com. Now it's time to take your hands off the wheel foot off the pedal, hand off that throttle, and let's go. In this segment, we're speaking with Andy Sabula, Vice President, Next Gen, and New Entrants at Airlines for America. Andy's background includes senior leadership roles at the Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics, or simply called RTCA, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, and the National Air Transportation Association, plus Andy's had a stint with the Federal Aviation Administration. In this segment, we're going to tap Andy's unique perspective of how civil aviation safely operates and interconnects. We'll talk about how aviation remains the safest form of transportation known, and the things the unmanned community should focus on as they integrate their operations into the national airspace system. Andy, welcome. Oh, thank you. So Andy, your title, is Vice President of Next Gen and New Entrants. And I would suspect that many members of our audience don't work with Next Gen on a day-to-day basis, nor New Entrants. Can you maybe kick things off by telling us a little bit about what is Next Gen and what is a new entrant? Well, sure. Uh, Next Gen is essentially modernization of the air traffic control system. The FAA has for about a decade been working on doing a pretty massive transformation of the air traffic control system, but they have to do it in a manner that allows for ongoing current operations. So it was described as changing a tire while you're going 55 on the interstate. The new entrance, um, the way we view it, and some may take offense at this, hopefully they don't, but we view unmanned aircraft systems and commercial space as new entrants to the system. And that's because conventional aviation, if you want to refer to it that way, has been around since, uh, I guess it started with the powered flight in 1903 with the Wright brothers. So Andy, when we think about this thing called next gen and changing that tire on the car as it goes rolling down the highway, what are all the components of next gen that I need to think about? I mean. Is it like air traffic control? Is it how the airplanes communicate? Is it all that? Can you help us understand what technologies make up NextGen? Sure, so the simplest way to look at it is communication, navigation, and surveillance. Communication is transitioning from relying totally on voice communication to text messaging that has to be certified so that it's safe, so it's far more complicated than what you can do on your cell phone. Um, In the navigation world, we're transitioning to using the GPS network as a means of helping aircraft navigate, which allows them a much more precise flight tracks. And then in the surveillance world, Um, rather than relying totally on radar, which we call pinging metal, um, we actually have a more interactive role of the aircraft through something called ADS-B, where it takes a GPS signal and communicates that back to the air traffic control network. And when I think about surveillance, which is what you called one of these technologies, Is that air traffic control? Is that something bigger than air traffic control or is there a little bit more to surveillance? So we actually refer to air traffic control as air traffic management because there's a lot of different elements of it. There's what you're going to do in the national airspace system today, which is kind of a planning element. You're on the ground, you're going to be taking off. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, The 
surveillance or the navigation or the communication, those are just elements within this bigger system of air traffic management. Well, let me ask you this. How old is the system we're trying to replace? Well, if you think about it, it came, it was originally bonfires on the top of hilltops. Um, we progressed to radio beacons and then to radar, which is a pretty much a World War II technology. So we're in essence replacing technology that was implemented when the FAA was formed in the late 50s. And I would suspect that one of the efficiencies might be getting from point A to point B faster. Is there more than that? Well, there's certainly the improvements and efficiencies. There's also an expansion of the capacity about how many aircraft can be handled by an air traffic controller in the system, um, as well as the ability to have additional flight tracks. So it's really about serving the customer. It's about um, getting more people the ability to fly and more cargo being able to be carried and tr transported around the country and around the world. Andy, we also just briefly mentioned this phrase called new entrance, and my ears picked up when you use the word commercial space, and I'm thinking of things like SpaceX, and I'm also thinking of technologies like urban air mobility, and I'm just kind of wondering, what are the challenges with these new technologies? I mean, is there a problem with the fact that I'm gonna shoot off a rocket? It's gonna to go to space. What's the relationship between that rocket flying into outer space and the commercial airline industry? So in the commercial space uh, industry, they have to get from the ground to space. And in doing that, they're transiting through the national airspace system. And what the FAA's uh, mechanism has been is to just close that airspace, sometimes for hours, for a commercial space launch. What we're attempting to do, and we can use these next-gen technologies I mentioned, is decrease the amount of time uh, that, that that airspace has to be closed. Andy, you're making it sound like these commercial spaceports are not as remote and isolated as they are, and they might have a bigger impact than what I might think. Is that right? Well, that's certainly true. One of the biggest uh, or most congested, if you will, uh, routes for flying is from Florida to the Northeast. And it just so happens that one of the favorite launch points is Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy. And that is uh, that has a definite impact when launches are occurring and launches are increasing because commercial space activity has been increasing. One of the ironies about commercial space launches is it's not uncommon that what may be being launched is going to actually support aviation. What I'd like to do now is maybe just kind of take a look and take a snapshot of commercial aviation. I know that there's a snapshot before COVID. I know there's a snapshot now during COVID. And I'm wondering if we can just start out, maybe you can share with us your thoughts on how expansive is commercial aviation? What, On a system level, what does aviation look like day to day? Yeah, so I'll be talking about it as it existed before the COVID impacts and, and hopefully you know, in a, in a not too distant future, we'll be back. But think of it, and this is the US orientation. Uh, $1.7 trillion of economic activity supporting approximately 10 million jobs. On a daily basis, uh, two and a half million passengers per day and 58,000 uh, tons of cargo on a daily basis. Uh, and approximately 28,000 flights. Yikes, as they say. That's, that's pretty expansive. And I, I do know that things have changed just a little bit in COVID. Can you maybe update us as to what aviation looks like right now? This is being recorded in August of 2020. And I'm just wondering, what are we seeing today? So uh, just a couple of the metrics. Uh, about half as many flights are being flown. 
and the number of passengers has gone down from 2.4 million down to about 750,000, so pretty significant decreases. In the cargo industry, the cargo industry is still very active because on the international front, um, obviously it's very critical to connect the United States to around the world. And then of course, within the United States, there's still a lot of need to move things around by air. Thanks, Andy. When we were talking earlier about new entrants, one of the things that has been the subject of previous conversations between us and some of the work that we've done is unmanned aircraft, UAS systems. And if you have this big, vibrant aviation system that's part of the national airspace system, and now we have this new entrant called unmanned aircraft coming on board, What are some of the challenges that the current system is facing with bringing these new entrants on board? And what do you think are going to be some of the longer term challenges that are posed by unmanned aircraft? So one of the just this is going to sound a little simple, but one of the real big issues is the fact that with an unmanned aircraft system, you don't have skin in the game. You're not sitting in the machine. And so your perspective is different as an operator than it is if you're actually flying the aircraft. And so helping the unmanned aircraft uh, industry understand where we're coming from, why we have the, the safety protocols in place and the network in place, which was really designed to support aviation. And of course, it's been developed over over a century or so. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of issues that we've had to work through to make commercial aviation incredibly safe. It's so predictable, people really don't think about the fact that, uh, that they're getting on an aircraft anymore. Let me ask you to picture yourself in the cockpit of an airplane. And you're looking out the window, and I want to say metaphorically, you happen to see an unmanned aircraft in the distance. What are you thinking about today about sharing the airspace with that unmanned aircraft? So, you know, first of all, when you're flying, you will see other airplanes. So seeing another aircraft in the air is not going to put a pilot into a panic mode. What you want to know is that the operator of that aircraft knows the rules and the regulations, the structure of the airspace, they're complying with safety rules and regulations. And part of that is their ability to either stay away from airspace that they shouldn't be flying in or being able to participate in the air traffic control system. What that means is to be able to communicate with an air traffic controller and be able to respond to their instructions, as well as being able to electronically um, be, be, um, be seen. Andy, as you look back on the safety record of civil aviation, I'm certain that there are key components that you can point to and say, because we shared data, for example, we're safer. What do you think are those key elements of aviation, commercial aviation, general aviation, even business aviation, that you could point to the unmanned aircraft industry and say, these things are done well, and these are things that you can learn from? Well, certainly when it comes to safety uh, data sharing, what the industry did about 20 years ago is they shifted from a responding to accidents and making fixes based on those accidents to uh, predicting um, and tracking issues that could in fact lead to problems because an accident is typically going to be a series of events. Any one event you can respond to and it's okay, but when you link them all together, um, then the response that a pilot makes to those inputs becomes much more critical. Um, so that's probably one of the big things is sharing data, that that data being as predictive as possible about potential issues, and then putting in responses. In the unmanned industry, 
there's a lot of individual uh, systems that are being designed and developed just because of the nature of the industry and the people that are involved because a lot of them are coming out of the, the, the technology world where you have proprietary ways of approaching um, whatever it is that you're developing, whether it's a phone or a computer system, uh, communications technology, whatever it may be. And so we have a more uh, challenging issue there of being able to share information, um, being able to make it available, and yet at the same time allow these businesses to continue to um, develop and be creative in the way they bring solutions because um, the industry certainly is going to need that as we go to integrate uh, huge numbers of unmanned aircraft into the system. Just to follow up on that, proprietary data, you know, how airplanes are made, how engines are manufactured, that's something that the FAA has dealt with as you pointed out, over the course of a hundred years of, of civil aviation. If you could just pick one or, or two things that the FAA could do to make sharing more comfortable for the unmanned world, what do you think those things would be? Uh, or, or maybe it's it shouldn't be comfortable. The FAA needs to mandate information sharing. Is, is there a way to, to thread this needle for the unmanned industry the same way that's been done for the manned aircraft industry? Yeah, there there is, an, and I think the FAA can encourage the industry to do it. I would be very surprised if the industry wouldn't want to do it, because if you want to be commercially successful, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to do it safely. And if you want to be commercially successful, you're going to need to integrate into the air traffic control system. Now that integration could mean I'm going to stay below 500 feet in these areas. Um, and so I need to have, I, the, the, the UAS operator, need to have my own means of being able to assure the FAA that I'm going to be able to do that safely. So some of the information sharing, and I think this will be unique for UAS operators, it's going to be both from an air traffic management side as well as the vehicle. And that's why a lot of times you'll, you'll in the UAS, just name itself, it's unmanned aircraft systems because it really is about kind of a link between comm, communications, uh, the surveillance and the navigation with the machine. We're in, in conventional aviation, um, they're a little bit more independent between the aircraft itself and the uh, air traffic management system. Andy, in the last couple minutes we have left, I'd just like to follow up on that theme of air traffic management. I would suspect that there are unmanned aircraft users right now that would like to have their vehicles either fly in the same airspace as manned aviation or use that airspace to fly through it to get to the outer edges of the atmosphere um, like we've seen with several next generation concepts of high altitude aircraft. I am just kind of wondering, what does that air traffic control system look like? Is it two separate ones? Is it an unmanned air traffic control system that talks to the manned aircraft control system? Is it one single federated system where everything is done by traditional ATC? What, what are the challenges we need to solve in this so-called unmanned air traffic management that need to be answered? That is uh, the question that we're all wrestling with at the moment. It has to be integrated, but the approach that the, the FAA is taking right now is to allow a certain degree of, I'll use the word autonomy, but that doesn't mean that, that there's not an active communication between the UAS community and the FAA. But the UAS community is essentially being kind of thrown the gauntlet, if you will, and say, how can you assure us, the FAA, that you're going to be able to do things? Like, for example, right now, um, there's a pending rulemaking on remote ID 
which is really critical because you've got to be able to have some means of knowing who is that UAS, um, how is it being controlled, and where is it operating. Um, and so the FAA put out a notice of proposed rulemaking that got an incredible amount of comments because it's the first time that they're making a foray into that. And so quite frankly, we're really working through that. And I, we've, got a lot to, we've got a lot to wrestle through. So Andy, I tend to think of commercial airlines as the operators of Airbus airplanes, Boeing, Embraers. But yet there's a role for unmanned aircraft and autonomous vehicles within airport operations, within airline operations. Can you kind of maybe look at your crystal ball and tell the audience a little bit about how unmanned aircraft may in fact be used by airlines and airports in the future? Sure, and don't have to look too far because there's several initiatives underway right now. Obvious one is, uh, if you will, the delivery of boxes and go- you know, with goods. And so we do have several members, uh, UPS and FedEx specifically, that are involved in some initiatives. Sometimes it's medical supplies, labs, you know, supporting medical labs, or it's actually delivering more um, uh, almost point of sale uh, items. So that will continue to grow. And it might even be that at some point in the future that it won't be just that, you know, delivery, but it might actually be the transportation over longer, uh, uh, longer paths. We'll, we'll see how, how things play out there. Um, for the, the overall aviation industry, you're going to also see the use of UAS as a tool, a tool to uh, uh, do things that right now people might have to do, like inspect the perimeter at an airport. They'll be, they're already being used in uh, some ways in supporting maintenance because it's pretty easy to get a, a small drone to be able to see the top of an aircraft, inspect the tail, um, and, and do those things that support aviation. So we're going to continue to see them being used in those ways like other industries are. And then finally, and this is going to be, it's very undefined as to how this will take place, but if the urban air mobility uh, comes into maturity, you, I could also see a connection between uh, passengers on, on aircraft, on an airline aircraft, um, coming into a, an airport and then using UAM to poten- potentially deliver them in, into the city. Probably is not for everyone, uh, but it might be for a certain uh, subset of our customers. Andy, with that, I just want to thank you for joining us in this segment. I really appreciated learning about your perspective on the airline industry, the safety challenge, and the UTM challenges as well. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thanks.